can gather today, we can say that I know, I am confident, I am certain that Jesus, you are with me. Whatever this world throws our way, whatever the enemy has in mind, Jesus, we who have come to you by faith, we who have come to the cross, we know that by your spirit you dwell in us and that you are with us, that our heavenly Father watches over us. So Lord, speak your truth to us today. Would you show us just the reality that you are with us whatever we're walking through, whatever we face. And give us confidence and faithfulness and boldness to hold fast to you whatever comes our way. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Well, as I was preparing for uh, this message and reading uh, the letters to the churches of Smyrna and of Pergamum and thinking about the content there, it, it struck me, I kind of, my mind went back to an experience I had back when I was a teenager. I was a young Christian uh, down in Southern California, and I'd only been a Christian for a short time, a couple of years, still figuring out, I didn't grow up in a Christian home, so figuring out all the Jesus stuff, and, and a friend of mine said, hey, there's this convention going on, it's this free convention at a church right by Disneyland. And the church we went to was pretty close to that. And so, and the, the church actually looked like a circus tent, even though it wasn't like a tent material. It was like a building, but it looked like kind of a circus tent thing and never been there before. He said, we got to go and see what's going on there. We're getting all these speakers in. And, and it was kind of a, he said, it'll be interesting and exciting because this was a church that was kind of real, a real active, kind of energetic church. And so I said, oh, that sounds great. Let's go check it out. I don't remember the whole message. We were there for part of one message. We were there for like 40 minutes. And this guy had been preaching before and he kept going after we kind of snuck out. But I remember that his main theme was this. This was his main theme. If you follow Jesus and have enough faith and live the right way with your confidence in Jesus, you will never have financial problems. You will never be sick. The path you walk on will always be smooth and life will be easy. That was kind of the message. And I was a pretty young Christian, but I'm sitting there. I, be, I was a young Christian, but I already read the whole Bible. And I was like on my second time through or my third time through, so I'd read the Bible quite a bit. And I'm thinking, that doesn't sound like what the Bible says. And I was kind of struggling with it. And then he got to the point, he started talking about the Apostle Paul. He said, now the Apostle Paul, he said, one of the most well-known characters in the New Testament, uh, wrote many books in the New Testament. He said, the Apostle Paul, he said, I've heard people say the Apostle Paul was a short little guy hunched over with a bad back and, and not, didn't have good eyes. And, and he says, that's not the Apostle Paul. And here's what I remember he said this. He said, the Apostle Paul was six foot four. He said, the Apostle Paul was never sick a day of his life. And he said, the Apostle Paul had a full head of hair. And I thought, wait a minute. <laughs> what does that have to do with following Jesus? Thank you. I didn't know either. Yeah. I love your heart for worship, and you're here with us. Yeah, and I love your dad, too. Uh, you. You're welcome, sweetie. And so I'm thinking, I, I'm just, I, was, I was struggling. And then, and then he, he said this, and this is the one that really threw me off. He said, and by the way, he said, we're all going to die someday, but if you're a faithful Christian, here's what he said. He said, you're going to die healthy. I'm not quite sure what it means to die healthy, but you're dead. Uh, and so I, I was struggling. I was, you know, and, and so then we eventually kind of had enough, and we kind of moved, uh, we, we headed out, and we heard the message. Uh, I need to be honest with you. Um, some of you might have ra been raised in that kind of preaching or that kind of teaching. This book is very honest and tells a different story. Um, Jesus, God in human flesh, who walked among us, no one followed the will of the Father more than Jesus, his son. And he ended up nailed to a wooden cross. The Apostle Paul, I don't know if he was 6'4 or not. I don't know how much hair he had. I don't think that really matters, his height or how much hair he had. But I know this. Five times the Romans strapped the Apostle Paul up and gave him the 40 lashes minus one. They whipped him within an inch of his life. Five times. He had 195 scars on his chest and sides and back and neck. He, he, his body was a tapestry of scars on scars on scars, and he followed Jesus. So when somebody says, if you just follow Jesus the right way, you'll never struggle, I have to wonder what book they've been reading. 
uh, because it's not the Bible that, that we read here at Shoreline Church. It's not the Word of God. And so I want to pray, and I want to just, uh, we're going to be thinking today about what does it mean to follow Jesus, to walk with Jesus in the dark times, in the dangerous times, in the difficult times, and we all have those. You can be faithful to Jesus and following him, but tough times seem to hit all of our lives. So Jesus, this is our prayer today. As we look at the letter to the church at Smyrna, and as we look at the letter to the church at Pergamum, as we look at a, pick, a part of this vision, Jesus, that you gave to John when he was on, in prison on the, the, the prison isle of Patmos, I pray you'll speak to our hearts. We will see the truth of who you are and who we are. And we will feel your strength and power fill our souls. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Well, last week we looked at the letter to the church in Ephesus. Remember, the book of Revelation is this vision that God gave to John the Apostle. And by the way, John the Apostle was faithful to Jesus, and they threw him in jail. They put him on this island that was basically a jail on an island. That's where he was for following Jesus. All right? And so if you look here on the map, last week we talked about, so, so when the letter went out, when this vision was written down, it went to seven churches. The first one, Ephesus, the bottom red dot on the far left there, Ephesus along the coast there. By the way, Patmos, the island of Patmos, is just off the coast from Ephesus. And so it went there, and then they brought the letter to the church of Smyrna, just above that, and then the church of Pergamum, then they looped back around to Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So the next, we're going to look at the churches of Smyrna and Pergamum. And I want you to get a feeling, now Jesus is speaking to these churches, real churches with real people living in a real time in history. So turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2, and we're going to look at two of the letters of the churches, and then we're going to kind of dip into the, into, into the, the vision that, 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 uh, that John sees. Uh, but we're going to begin in verse 8 of chapter 2 of the book of Revelation. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. That's Jesus. If you read chapter 1, the vision of Jesus, this is part of the vision of Jesus. He is the first and the last. He's over all things. He died and came to life again. He's conquered the, the grave and hell and death. And here's what Jesus says to this church, to this congregation. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. They're being slandered against. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. This is Jesus talking to a, a real church of real people. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. And you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death. And I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And the one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Just in that short introduction to the church at Smyrna, we notice this. They're going through financial struggles. They're struggling financially. He says, I know about your afflictions and your poverty. You know what he says to them? You may be financially poor, but you're rich. He's talking about spiritual blessings. No matter what happens financially, you have certain blessings no one can ever take away from you. But they have financial struggles. Afflictions. He says, you're going through afflictions. You're being slandered against. People are lying about you, talking about you, slandering you. He says, there's suffering coming up for some of you. You're facing satanic, demonic, spiritual attack. Some of you have been imprisoned for your faith and you're facing persecution. I'm not trying to depress anybody. But this is a real church with real people. And Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, speaks to them and says, I know you're going through a dark and dangerous and difficult time. And I believe Jesus says that to people today too, to his church today. He says, I know that... that that some of you are going through really dark, really difficult times. And, and, and it's heavy, and it's difficult. So we continue on to the letter of the church in Pergamum. Chapter 2 of Revelations, verses 12 through 17. Let's see if things get any better. <laughs> Let's see if it gets any more cheerful here, okay? To the angel of the church in Pergamum. This is the next city going up, up north there on the map. These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. That's a vision of Jesus. Authority, power, victory. He has the sharp, double-edged sword. He can protect you. He can watch over you. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. He says, your town, Pergamum, by the way, is the throne of Satan. Wow. 
yet you remain true to my name. You, you, you still hold true to me. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. So a member of their church or a fellow Christian from that town was killed for their faith. And Jesus says, but you've held on to your faith even when there's martyrdom going on. Nevertheless, verse 14, I have a few things against you. He talks about false teaching. We're going to spend next week looking at the topic of false teaching because it comes up, continues to come up as we go forward. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold the teaching of Balaam, this false teacher, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, idolatry, and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. And listen to the call in verse 16. Repent, turn around, therefore. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Those that are false teachers, Jesus says, I'm going to bring the sword of my mouth, I'm going to deal with them. But you don't fall into what they're teaching. Verse 17. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna, heavenly provision. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it. God renames us, gives us a new name. We talked about that Wednesday night at our night of worship. Known only to the one who receives it. So as you read the letter to the church of Pergamum, as, as Jesus speaks to that church, he says, listen, you're living in Satan's backyard. Spiritual warfare is real. Spiritual battles are real. And he says to the church of Pergamum, you're right in the middle of it all. I mean, it's, you're in a dangerous place spiritually. And you know what they probably all said? Yeah, we know it. <laughs> we can see it. We can feel it. Some of you have gifts of discernment. You can tell when you walk into an environment where there's spiritual oppression or power at work there. That was going on in the city of Pergamum. He talks about martyrdom, that Antipas had been killed for his faith. And they held strong to Jesus. Instead of saying, well, okay, if it's getting dangerous, if it's getting scary, I'm bailing out on Jesus. They held fast to their faith. And there's false and enticing teaching. And they're not falling into it. They're holding to the truth of Jesus. And one more passage. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 12. And I, and I want to, and this will not be on the screen, it won't be on the screens at home or here in the worship center, out in the courtyard. I want you just to, even if it'll help to close your eyes, I want you to picture as this vision is unfolding in Revelation 12, beginning in verse 7. The spiritual battle is going on, not just on earth, but in heaven. Verse 7, then a war broke out in heaven. Michael, one of the archangels, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. This battle's going on. But he was not, Satan was not strong enough, the, the de dragon was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him, cast down. And then verse 10 says this, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. There's that same word that we hear in the letter to the church of Pergamum. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. He says, we know that Antipas has been killed, but you still hold strong to your faith. The question is not, will you and I face hard times? That's not the question. We walk on this earth, there's going to be tough times. The question is, how will we respond? What will we do? How do we How do we? Stay strong in our faith no matter what we face. So here's my question. Can you see Jesus? As, as, you, as, you, hear, as, you, as you read this letter to the church at Smyrna, and, 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 and there's, a, there's this picture, there's this vision of Jesus. He is the first and the last. He died and came to life again. Can you see this picture of Jesus who rules and reigns? When you look at these passages, here's what you learn. You learn that he is the first and the last. He rules over history and eternity. 
There's this vision of Jesus to the church at Smyrna. He is the first and the last. He's over all history, over all eternity. Jesus Christ rules over all. We see that he died and came to life again. He rules over the grave, over death, over sin, over hell. He rules over all things. He came to life again and broke the back of Satan and death. He has the sharp double-edged sword. And he rules over all authorities, all powers, human and spiritual. When, when you see Jesus with his sword, and if you don't like militaristic language, I, I would say at this moment when you're looking at the book of Revelation, get over it and see the picture. He has authority. He has power. He's won the victory. There's a battle, and if you continue reading through Revelation, there's a battle, and this battle comes kind of in cycles. There's sort of like a, a picture of the battle. Jesus wins. There's praise to Jesus. There's a picture of the battle. And so you, so you've, you've got seals, and you've got horses, and you've got censors, and you've got all these, you know, in this cycle of things. But in every case, Jesus wins. And that's the picture. That, that's the drama that's being unfolded in Revelation. That's why you don't pick it apart and dissect it, but you get the epic drama because when you see the whole thing, you go, wow, it's, it's bad, it's tough. At the end of time, it's all going to be wrapped up together. But Jesus is on the throne. He wins the victory, and we have confidence in that. And then we see in Revelation 12 that Satan, the dragon, is cast down. And remember when I told you uh, the first week, don't try to fill in all the blanks on the book of Revelation. If you dissect Revelation, you'll kill it. Anything you dissect, you kill. If you dissect, dissect Revelation, you'll kill it. Well, how do, how do I know that when it says the dragon, that's Satan? Because right in the passage it says, that dragon, the ancient dragon, who, by the way, is Satan or the devil. Oh, now I know. <laughs> See, I let Jesus tell me what things mean. And when Jesus doesn't tell me in the passage what it means, I'm not going to play this guessing game. I'm going to trust that when Jesus wants to make it explicit and clear, he'll make it clear. When he's wanting me just to get the big picture, I'll just read it and let the, the, the truth of it sweep over me and the vision sweep over me. And so we see that the enemy is cast down and Jesus is lifted up. So let me ask you this question. If he is the first and the last, if he died and came to life again, if he holds the sharp double-edged sword and if he's cast the enemy down, here's my question. So what are you worried about? What are you worried about? If you've come to the cross, if you've met Jesus and confessed your sins, the moment you do that, your sins are washed away. The spirit of the living God moves inside of you, takes up residency, and will never leave you and never forsake you. What are we anxious about? What are we worried about? This life, Jesus rules and reigns over this world. Forever, Jesus solved that one too. If you put your faith in him, you belong to him forever and ever. Death? Death should hold no fear for a follower of Jesus. I have some people say, I'm not afraid of dying. I'm just afraid of how I'll die. <laughs> I don't know. Well, we don't know. Somebody said, that, somebody said that to each other, right? But at the end of the day, he's on the throne. He wins. Are, are you anxious? Are you worried about the guilt of sin? If you live your days anxious and worried about the guilt of your sin, then I want to ask you, do you understand what Jesus did on the cross? He paid the price for your sin. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us, the psalmist says. Now, the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 6, we don't just keep sinning that grace may abound. The point is not, oh, well, if I don't have to feel bad about sin, I'll just go out and sin. That's not the point. When you know the grace of Jesus, you, don't, you, you more and more learn to live for him. You don't want to sin. But you don't live under the judgment of sin. And if you're dealing with guilt all the time over your sin, then ask this question, is that guilt coming from you, from the enemy, or from Jesus? And I suggest it's coming from you, or maybe another person, or the enemy of your soul. It's not coming from Jesus. Why? Because Jesus says, I paid it. It's gone. All your judgment, all your shame, all your guilt. Jesus says, I took it on the cross. I buried it, and I rose in glory. So now walk in the peace of that. What are you worried about? Political unrest? You worried about political unrest? Be a good citizen. Be wise. Vote. Get involved. But don't worry about it. Why? Because there is one king of kings and one lord of lords. <coughs> he rules, he reigns, and he will forever. Amen? Amen? There's one king of kings and one lord of lords. And so I know who's on the throne of heaven and the throne of eternity. Amen? Amen. And so live with that confidence. What are you worried about? Spiritual attacks? Well, that was going on, right? In both of the churches, Smyrna and Pergamon, there's issues of spiritual battles. 
So the anxiety is not, will spiritual battles happen? They will. When Jesus walked on this earth, God in human flesh, read Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, the enemy came and tried to tempt Jesus. So will there be spiritual battles? Yes. But he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. That's what the Bible says. That when you resist the devil, he will flee from you. When you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. You can live with that confidence. So why are we anxious? Why are we worried if we know how the story ends? So (coughs) we have to have that vision of Jesus, victorious and in power. So we get the vision. Now we get the message. There's certain truths that just kind of come through these letters to the churches that I want you to hear. So here's just a couple of messages to understand God's truth. Here's the first one. You find it in verse 9. You are rich. If you're a Christian, you are rich. Now, Jesus says to the church of Smyrna, he says, I know your afflictions and your poverty. I know you're going through hard times, and some of you do not have much financially. I know your afflictions and your poverty. But this is what Jesus says, yet you are rich. What's Jesus talking about? He's saying some of you are going through times of affliction. Some of you don't have a lot of material resources. But if you're a Christian, you are rich. Why? Well, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 tells us. In Ephesians 1, 3, the Holy Spirit of God inspires the Apostle Paul to write these words. He says, and you, if you have faith in Jesus, you have every spiritual blessing in Christ in the heavenly realms. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Jesus Christ belongs to you if you're a Christian. When I was 15 years old and prayed to receive Jesus Christ, I received every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, and no one can take those away from me. When you're a Christian, you have heaven as your home. Pretty good? Who can take that from you? Nobody. You have the church as your family. Who can take that from you? Nobody. And by the way, our church is universal. We're all over the world. We got branches in every country, folks. (laughs) The church is everywhere. And the only one who will exclude you from the church is you yourself. I'm not going to go to church. I'm going to avoid the church. That's your choice. But, but if you walk into a biblical church, the arms of God's people are open to you. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. You know what people in our world want right now? What most people want? They want, they want to be loved. They want love. They want some joy in their life. They want a little bit of peace in the turmoil. Love, joy, peace. You know what those are? Those are the first three fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> When you're a Christian, the Spirit of God lives in you. You have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. These are things that are growing in you. No one can take those things away. And the list goes on and on. (coughs) You have friendship with God. You have your guilt taken away. You have power for spiritual battles as you walk in the power of Jesus. You have the hope of heaven. You have the gifts of the Spirit. You have a purpose and a ministry, something God wants to do through you to be a blessing for others. So Jesus says to the church in Smyrna, I know about your afflictions, I know about your poverty. But here, huddle up. Come in, come here, come here. He says, but you are rich. And it's not the stuff you have. Ultimate riches last forever. And Jesus knows all of our things we collect, and all of our trinkets, and all of our different things, Jesus knows they're all going to go up in smoke. And he knows the, the eternal blessings in Jesus he's given you will last forever. So he can look at you as a Christian and say, I know your afflictions, I know your poverty but you are rich, and we have to live with that confidence. You don't have to live in fear, verse 10. Whatever situation you face, Jesus is clear, you don't have to live in fear when you walk with him, when you live in him. You have life, verses 10 and 11, so you don't have to have fear of death. Our eternal life has begun already. When this life ends, we begin forever with Jesus. As a matter of fact, we've begun forever with Jesus already. We belong to him, so you can walk in that confidence and that certainty. You need to know and follow the truth. That's one of the lessons, one of the messages that we're going to dig into next week in greater detail. But, but in, in, the, in, in the church in Pergamum, there's at least two streams of false teaching, the teaching of Balaam and the teaching of the Nicolaitans. And, and, and Jesus says, don't go for false teaching. Don't fall, in, don't, don't fall into it. Don't believe it. As, Christ, as Christians, we have one book, this book. It's true from beginning to end. So we follow what this book says even when our culture doesn't. Even when friends and families don't under, family members don't understand. We follow God's truth because it's God's truth and it doesn't change. 
So hopefully you have a vision, a picture of, of the early church, a vision of heaven, a, a vision of, of, of the enemy being cast down, the dragon being cast down, Jesus being lifted up. Hopefully you hear the message of what his word is saying. But here's our final thing. Getting a move on it. Taking action in our life and in the church. We need to not just be, James says, don't just be a hearer of the word, just don't know what it says, and deceive yourself. Do what it says. Live it out. So here's some of the things that we, we as followers of Jesus who know his word, who love his word, who understand his victory and his power and his presence, here's some of the ways we live if we live out what we're learning here from the book of Revelation. Here's the first one. We will be faithful even to the point of death. Say, I will be faithful to Jesus whatever I face, even if it costs my life. Will you be? Will you hold on to Jesus whatever you face? And some of you are still struggling, going, well, but I kind of, when I became a Christian, I kind of got the impression that if I know Jesus, everything kind of goes my way and everything should be kind of smooth sailing. You know what Jesus said when he called people to follow him? He said, if you're going to be my disciple, the word disciple means follower, he says, if you're going to be my disciple, if you're going to follow me, he says, there's just three things you should be aware of. Number one, every day, deny yourself. It's not about me. Then he says, take up your cross. You know what the cross was? An instrument of death. Offer your life every day. So every day, here, here's the easy journey. Here's, it's so easy to be a Christian. Just deny your, what you want every day. Be ready to die every day. And then Jesus says, follow me. Go wherever I lead you, not where you want to go, where I want you to go. So just deny yourself. Be willing to die for Jesus. And don't follow your plan, but follow his plan. Does that sound easy to anybody? Where, where did we, where did this come from? This, this, I, you know, Jesus said, this is what it means to follow me. These early Christians in Smyrna and in Pergamum, they're going, they're, they're, they're right where Satan lives. One of their friends has been martyred and killed. They're struggling, but, but they're holding on to Jesus. So be faithful even to the point of death. Will you pray that to Jesus today? Will you say, Jesus, I will hold your hand no matter what comes my way. I will be faithful to you whatever I face. And I tell you, as a pastor, I talk with people who have kind of given up on their faith because they had a rocky time in their life. I can't believe that God would let this happen to me. And they question if they're going to be faithful to him. I talked to one young person one time who said to me, I don't know if I can believe in and follow Jesus anymore. I said, what happened? And they, they said, my grandma died. And I said, how old was your grandma? And they said, well, she was in her 90s. And I thought, you're going to deny your faith because your 90-year-old grandma passed away after a long... Now, I can, it's sad when you lose a loved one, right? But if you're going to deny your faith because elderly people pass away, then guess what? At some point, you're going to deny your faith because this, you know, if you're going to deny your faith because times get tough, make sure that's not the condition of your heart because times are going to get tough. Whether it's a health issue or a relational issue or an emotional issue or a financial issue, there's difficulties in life. There was for the Christians in Smyrna. There was for the Christians in Pergamum. There was for the Apostle Paul. There was for Jesus. Who are we to think that we're going to be the ones that go through life unscathed, with you know, that we're going to die healthy? And if we don't, maybe we don't have enough faith in Jesus. No. But when we die, we're going to be with Jesus forever. Amen. Amen. However it happens, whenever it happens. We will not renounce our faith. Verse 13. We will not renounce our faith. And that means we know what we believe and we stand on it. I will not renounce. I will not deny my faith. I will hold, I will hold to what this book says. So someone comes to me or someone comes to you and they say, okay, wait, so you're one of those Christians. So you really believe, you really believe that like some guy who lived 2,000 years ago he died, he rose again, and you think because of your faith in him you're going to heaven? You really believe that? Maybe that's a professor at a university. Maybe that's a friend who thinks they're really smart. You really believe that? And, and you look at them and you say, absolutely, with all my heart, more than life itself. Don't deny your faith. What if they laugh at me? What if they mock me? They might. But you know what you believe and you know who you believed in. So you hold to your faith whatever you face. Wait, wait, you're one of those Christians, you're, you're, so you're telling me, you're one of those Christians, that you're going to forgive people when they wrong you, and you're going to love people when they're mean to you? And you go, yeah, the best I can. I haven't got it perfected yet, and we're still working at that one, but yeah, I, I'm going to try to forgive people who wrong me, like Jesus forgave me, because that's what he calls me to do. That's standing up for your faith. I'm going to love people who persecute me, because that's what Jesus called me to do. 
You know, when Jesus is hanging on the cross, nails driven through his wrists, nails through his feet, he looks at the ones who drove the nails through his body, and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's our Jesus. You mean you're going to be one of those kind of Christians? You're going to live like that, and you're going to say, as best I can, in the power of Jesus, I will live for him. I will follow him. Oh, you're one of those Christians who believes what the Bible says about human sexuality? Big topic today. Huge topic today, right? You believe men are men and women are women and boys are boys and girls are girls? You go, yeah, I do. I do with all my heart. Because the Bible says that God created male and female. In his image, he created them male and female. He created them from the beginning. Now, will I love people with compassion because there's incredible sexual brokenness in our world? There's almost no person that you're going to meet who isn't touched by some sexual brokenness in their own life or the life of someone that they, they love. Will we be a church of compassion and love and embrace people wherever they are? Absolutely. But we will stay faithful to the word of God. And, you're gonna, and 50 other questions. Well, you believe this, you believe that, and you just go, if the Bible... See, see, the world keeps changing, and the world keeps adjusting what is right and wrong. But that's God's domain. And God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and first. So we will not renounce our faith. We will hold what we believe, even if it's not popular, even if people don't understand. We'll do it with gentleness and kindness, but we'll do it with confidence. We will repent. When we realize we're down a wrong path, that we're not honoring Jesus, that we're dishonoring in some way, we will repent. We will turn back to him. We'll notice when we're, we're buying into something that isn't true. We'll notice when we're heading down the wrong road. And to repent means to stop, to turn around, and to go back towards Jesus. So we will be people of repentance. And guess what? Every one of us, including your pastors, are going to have moments where we realize, I need to repent and live more for Jesus. But that's what we're called to do. And here, in, in the letter to the church at Pergamum, he, he, they're called to repent of idolatry, immorality, and false teaching. We're going to dig into that next week. But where there's false teaching, we have, to, we have to know this book so well that when somebody teaches something that's against the book, against God's word, we can say, that's not true. And somebody says, well, but it's my truth. Say, well, I don't go on my truth or your truth. I go on his truth. Amen? amen. I mean, that's what we believe. Oh, that was a weak amen. I don't, I don't go on my truth or you tr your truth. I go on the truth of Jesus and his word. Amen? amen? Better. Thank you. Be on your toes. Pay attention. You never know when I'm going to ask for an amen. And if I'm tricking or if I'm serious. Thank you. A bonus amen. I like the bonus amen. At the end of the letter to the church in Pergamum, there's these two images that are given. I want to close with these. So just kind of quiet your heart. At the end of the book, it says, to those who are victorious, those who hold on, those who hold fast, those who remain faithful, it says, I will give some of my hidden manna. In the Bible, manna was always heavenly provision. Surprising heavenly provision. God is ready as you go through whatever you're going through to impart on you his hidden man, the provision that you need. It may not always be the provision you want, and if you could order and boss God around, which we can't, it may not be what you would tell God you needed, but God will surprise you with his provision. Notice the manna he gives. And remember the manna for the people of Israel? It was always manna for a week and a month. No, it was always manna for what? The next day. So I encourage you to pay attention to God's surprising provision, manna from heaven. And also he says, I will give you a new name. When I turned 15, I got a new name. We talked about this at our night of worship as we were going through the names of God. When I turned 15, I got, a, I got this book that someone gave me called The Bible. And when I read it, I discovered that I was the same person I was before, but I'd been transformed by Jesus. And I discovered my identity. People are always trying to find their identity. I found out my identity when I read this book. I am a beloved son of the living God. I'm his boy. I'm his kid. Cleansed by his grace, loved and paid for by his blood. That's who I am. And so Jesus, this is our prayer. Whatever we're facing right now, whatever the darkness, the difficult, the dangerous time we might be in right now, will you remind us that we're in good company? We're with every Christian who's ever walked on this earth. We're with the people of Smyrna and Pergamon. And Lord, as we face those times, may we hold fast to you. May we keep our faith in you. May we not give up. May we not bail out on what we believe and what we know is true. And God, in your gentle, powerful presence, will you pour out hidden manna, 
Give us what we need for the day to make it through what we're facing. May, may we rejoice in that and celebrate in that good gift that you lavish on us. And Lord, remind us who we are, that you have given us a name. We, some in this room, we are, daughter, are, are, are daughters of the living God. Some are sons of the living God. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Let us hold to what you have said we are. Let us understand who you have said we are. And let us follow you in all things. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word, for this vision, for this revelation. Let it come alive in our lives and transform how we live so that we are ready to meet you face to face whenever that day comes. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Hey, before I ask you to stand and send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give you two important announcements. Uh, one is this, that we had children dedicated this morning. At Shoreline, we don't do infant baptism. We do infant dedication, but it's an important time for parents and family and the church to come around and say, we're offering this little one to you. If you have a child you want to have dedicated, there's a class today that Pastor Roy, who led the dedication time, is, will be leading at 1 o'clock, but it's online, 100% online. So if you're here and you want to be part of that class, get home, go on the website, Shoreline website, and register, and we'll make sure that you're part of that class. And then also today, I'm leading a class at 12.30. So in 25 minutes, 12.30, right here through the lobby, that big room right through there, the youth room there, uh, the Pacific room, I'm leading a membership class. If you come to it, you don't have to join the church, but, it, but you do have to come to it if you want to join the church. And if you want to learn more about Shoreline, come and join me. That will be live on campus at 12.30 and live online at 12.30. So if you're online and you want to come to the new members class, uh, last time I taught it, I think I had about 20 live and about 15 people online. I have a big monitor right in front of me that shows me everybody online, and I have the class out here, and I teach everybody at the same time. So if you want to be part of that, go on our website and register for that, and I'd love to see you at 1230. 1 o'clock, online only, child dedication, 1230, membership with me on campus or online. And finally, if you want prayer, we have our teams getting ready on both sides. They love, man, one, two, three, four, five prayer people. So if you have a prayer need, today's the day, man. We've got a great team here ready, and they love to pray. There's power in prayer. So if you want prayer and you're on campus, come on inside if you're outdoors and come up here for prayer. If you're online, all you need to do is call the number you see right there and there's somebody who's going to answer the phone and pray with you. Or you can type in and use the email address and send us your prayers and we'll put them on our prayer list and we will share that with our prayer team here at the church and they will pray for you faithfully and consistently. And then finally, if you're new at Shoreline, if you're on campus here and you're new, we're so glad you're here. We want to give you a warm personal welcome. So just go right through the lobby to the Connection Center. They have a little gift bag they want to give you. They want to answer any questions you have. Just give you a warm personal greeting. So go by there if you're on campus. If you're online, all you got to do is text the word welcome to the phone number you see on your screen, and we will connect with you and have a warm personal connection as best we can <coughs> Excuse me, online. So be sure you do that. I want to invite everyone to stand wherever you are. If you're at home, on the campus, outdoors, indoors, let's stand together, and let me send you off with a word of blessing. As we close this time together, God knows your journey. You may be following him faithfully and you keep bumping into obstacles and challenges, but understand that Jesus is with you. He loves you. If you put your faith in him, hold strong to that faith. If you haven't put faith in Jesus, Cry out to him. Open your heart to him. Talk to one of our pastors, and we'll talk to you about the journey of coming to put your faith in Jesus. It's, it's not a long journey, but it's coming to the cross and receiving his grace. As you go from this place, may God surprise you with hidden manna and provision for the day, and may you go profoundly aware of who you are in Christ. If you've come to the cross, if you receive Jesus, you are a son of the living God. You are a daughter of the living God a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Go from here as his people and bring his grace everywhere you go. Amen? Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week as we continue on in the book of Revelation.